my name is Fabian Deutsch. I'm um, an engineering manager at Red Hat. And upstream, I'm working on the Qbert project. And that's why I'm more than happy to be here with Ryan. Um, and we're going to speak about, I'll hand it off to you, in the, about Qbert, um, which is part of OpenShift virtualization. And we're not going to speak about OpenShift virtualization in specifically right now, but about a different use case of Qbert. So Ryan. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Ryan Halsey. Uh, I work at NVIDIA in NVIDIA's cloud division. Uh, I'm specifically focused on building the infrastructure for GeForce Now. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So uh, what is GeForce Now? So probably some people in the crowd have heard about it or used the service. So it's a, it's a service that NVIDIA offers for streaming games in the cloud. And so uh, if you wanted to fire it up and you wanted to fire, play a game, this is a service you can use and play in like a desktop-like experience. And so if you're like me, who's got like a 10-year-old PC sitting on your desk that you really love, and you, a new game comes along like Cyberpunk, and you really want it to play on a 3080, you know, and you get RTX and get 60 FPS, well, I, you can use GeForce Now if you wanted to. Instead of changing that desktop that you really like, for whatever reason, because cards are expensive, you know. So GeForce Now is a, a cloud gaming service. You can get that desktop-like experience for, for streaming all sorts of games. And just to give you a little picture of actually what this looks like, there's uh, data centers all over the world, and we have about 30 plus, maybe almost 40 now, data centers in, um, you know, in your, local, uh, your local region. So what I w also want to talk about is the infrastructure behind this. So uh, GeForce Now is, um, uh, we're actually faced with the problem a few years ago, and the... The original architecture for GeForce Now is very VM-based. is focused on, you know, the, the monolithic model. We create VMs and we uh, provide those as our control plane. We have our workloads that run in VMs, and we wanted to move to a more microservice-based approach. And the the issue was is we how do we do this? We know we want to go to Kubernetes. We want to we know we want to use containers. How do we move? How do we do this without completely abandoning our investment? And so this is where we actually looked at uh, adopting Qvert. And so the next generation of, of uh, the GeForce Now infrastructure is actually based on Qvert and Kubernetes. So we took that previous investment where we had uh, our VM-based approach and we brought them forward to actually run those those workloads and on some of our control plane on, on Qvert. And now we have containers and now we have this ecosystem which is microservice-based for some of our services and we have also our traditional uh, VM-based services that we continue to run. And so this kind of gave us that nice easy on-ramp to transitioning into this new world of microservices. Um, so how, even more details about this, like we have a, uh, we have a device plugin that we use, like this is a device plugin is we actually ship around as part of the GPU operator in, OL, in OLM. Um, this is a device plugin is how Kubernetes exposes, um, you know, how you attach GPUs, for example, to a, to a guest. Um, so we use that heavily. Uh, we have uh, for we use DPUs for network offloading, some performance reasons, security reasons, uh, lots of good stuff you get with DPUs. We we use um, uh, throughout our data centers. Uh, for local storage, we uh, have a bunch of NVMe drives that we that we use. So we don't use like um, you know any sort of cloud storage. We have we have lo uh, local storage. Uh, and then for scale wise, so I have here like about 40 data centers. It's 30 to 40 data centers worldwide. Uh, hundreds of nodes per cluster, and then um, thousands of virtual machines and pods that we have inside of a cluster. Um, and so can we, uh, we actually use the upstream release of Kubernetes. Uh, we're actually making our way to 126 now. And um, for Qvert, we have a fork that we, we do. Uh, we have a bunch of reasons we do this, and mainly it's because uh, a few things that we needed to customize with CPU pinning, VGPU pinning, a few things that we needed to do to make it so that we can consume it. We use 0.5.0, and we're eventually making our way to, to 0.5.9. Cool. Thank you very much, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so before I proceed, how many of you actually know what Qbert is or had their hands on it? Mm, that's a nice ratio. For the hands that have not been lifted, a short reminder. So Qvert, Qvert is an extension to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is helping us to run containers, to so orchestrate containers. And with Qvert, you're able to take your legacy, your 20 old years old legacy, so VMs from OpenStack, from wherever you want it, actually, um, over to Kubernetes as well, and run it there natively alongside containers. Why is that helpful? 
right? We believe that it's helpful because you can use Kubernetes. It's a single control plane, right? And your single, your single mental model, right? Every every platform has their own mental model, right? If you think of OpenStack, if you think of vSphere, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, or OpenShift Kubernetes, then all of them have their model, right? And by converging the workloads on on one platform, there's a mental mental reduction for you to think about more fancy things than a platform. Um, and you have your assets running on the same platform, right? So it's easier to connect them and to make the transition, right? Like, like you did at NVIDIA, right? They said, we need an opportunity to, to keep our legacy, right? Our investments, but still give us the room to evolve. And that's what we want to enable all of you, <laughs> um, as I suspect that many of you have got VMs, um, to, yeah, to, to gain the same benefits uh, from Kubernetes that um, you know. All right. While NVIDIA is using uh, Kubert directly with their own um, on-premise deployment of Kubernetes, um, we have points of, uh, points of contact, right? So we, we on, on the Red Hat side, are using Kubert as part of OpenShift virtualization. And some of the problems that um, NVIDIA, as one of our community members, has run into is interesting to us as well. So the first point that is well, became relevant is actually scale, right? So we saw that you run a lot of data centers with a lot of VMs and a lot of nodes, actually. Um, far more nodes than we usually run with OpenShift. Um, so there was a big scale initiated upstream to, to add all the, the details, right? All the metrics, all the tunings, the small code changes that you need in order to really trace, can we run that many VMs? How do we run them? How well do they run them? What about regressions in an upcoming release, right? So we created the scale in the Kubert community um, initiated by NVIDIA, and through our collaboration, we were able to, to add this regression testing to, to the Kubert release process, which is helping us on both, both sides. Um, so one, one part of it was these uh, phase transition metrics in order to see how long does it actually take to launch a VM, right? It can be vastly different depending on the use case. The different storage providers, different networking providers, all of them have their own timings. Um, but with these metrics, you are able to trace that down and to see where do we spend the, the time. Systemd or systemctl blame, I think, is the uh, node local variant of it. We also had an opportunity to uh, to collaborate on the um, on the networking side of the house, right? So, Kubert uh, provides two mechanisms to connect your VM to a network. One is by default, a VM is connected to the pod network, so that it can speak to every pod on your on your control plane. You can limit the access or control the access to the VM using Network policies, like you can control it to pods as well. Uh, you can use it with services and ingress, everything you know. Um, and on the other side, Kubernetes also supports attaching multiple interfaces using Multus. Um, and our collaboration primarily focused at that stage on the pod network, right? So to make that efficient, to make sure that the latency is low. There were some uh, state problems with the bridge networking that we had for the pod network in Kubert, and that's where we added like production-ready code uh, to Kubert. Um, a major change that um, is actually reflecting also in Kubert's maturity status is um, Kubert's release cadence, right? Kubert's been out since uh, 2016, and by now we think it's time to, um, to signal that we're major. I mean, we're used in production not only at NVIDIA, but also in other places. And uh, so we are aiming to get to a V1 release. So one preparation in order to get to V1 was to align our release schedule to Kubernetes. Right? Before, we had like a monthly release schedule, which is pretty hectic. Right? It's hectic for developers to write code, but it's also hectic for customers or adopters because you're always chased right, to, to deploy your new update right? because Kubernetes releases are also not supported forever, but only for like, like a year or half a year. So we try to redu reduce the number of releases in order to provide well-tested, stable, and supportive for a year uh, releases in preparation for this V1 release. These releases are now aligned to Kubernetes, so that usually you get a Kubernetes update, and a few weeks later, the Kubert release is following. Why do we follow Kubernetes? Because we align a Kubert release to a specific Kubernetes release, right? So that you know this is a match. Um, and if you choose a specific Kubernetes version, then it should be really clear to you what Kubert version do I need to, to use or to choose in order to have the perfect combination of both. By the way, Kubert and Kubernetes is not enough because in Kubernetes you have a lot of freedom about what is my storage provider, what's my networking provider. 
So there are more degrees of freedom than only Kubernetes, right? From a Kubernetes perspective, there are more degrees of freedom than only Kubernetes. Like it also depends on what is your storage provider, what's your network provider, in order to understand what is my the maturity of the overall system and what is the functional scope of the overall system. Like CSI providers, they can support snapshots or they cannot, right? So there are differences between them. All right, but that is not where our collaboration ended. So something that's coming up um, is OVN Kubernetes. So um, OpenShift for a while um, was delivering the OpenShift SDN uh, to connect the pod network. Um, but we see that this is not sufficient for all use cases. Right? We, we want to see that we provide a more modern experience for networking in OpenShift, not only for pods, but also for networks. And we saw a point of alignment to use OVN for it. I mean, OVN is well known from the OpenStack side of the house or the OpenStack uh, project. Uh, so we focus on writing an operator or a CNI plugin uh, to support L2 overlay networks with Multus for Kubernetes and for Qubit as well, including all the fancy stuff like multi-network policies and, and services to tie into all the other features like ingress and uh, load balancers. At the same time, but not surfaced in, an, uh, in GeForce Now, is our joint collaboration on the GPU operator. So NVIDIA is also creating, I think, graphics cards and uh, other kind of accelerators. And you can use them in OpenShift as well. Um, NVIDIA provided or has all the domain knowledge to, to empower those cards. And we jointly created a GPU operator to make it easy to actually get these drivers to the hosts where they need to belong in order to slice your NVIDIA GPU up and allocate it to your container or your VM. And there's also some opportunities for future collaboration. For example, the dynamic resource allocation, which is just surfacing in Kubernetes itself. Um, there is more CPU tuning we can do to increase the performance of our workloads. And ultimately, last but not least, is also the support of, um, for ARM, not only for the control pane, but also for workloads. I think that's roughly um, the scope of our talk. I think we are on time. Uh, we will be happy to hear any questions about Kubert, NVIDIA, or OpenShift. Wonderful. Thank you for the questions already. Um, yeah, the question. Oh, I think we can repeat the question then. It's loud. Or you shout. <laughs> <It's like laughs> the, qu the question was if uh, UDP was implemented for uh, Kubernetes as well, because Kubernetes is HTTP based. So how the heck do we get UDP traffic in and out of the VMs? So we have uh, we have dedicated interfaces for for specific for game traffic. So we we don't we don't use the Kubernetes network specifically for for using. For streaming, the any of the game traffic will use external NICs for this stuff. So we'll we'll attach them, and and that's how we'll we'll offload to the DPU, and then we can stream that way. So we don't we don't need to implement it. By the way, that is also why we collaborate on OV and Kubernetes up here, right? It's because it's for layer two network traffic, right? We 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 acknowledge that Kubernetes is HTTP based and HTTPS, obviously, but there's more than just HTTP. So a robust layer two solution is is what we need, right? We want logically defined networks. We don't want to physically bridge that to some switch. So the, the question was, are we, is NVIDIA contributing its changes to upstream or are there changes that are downstream that are, haven't been contributed or kept internal? So the, there, there are changes that we do have internal. What we try to do is we, we look at the changes uh, we see and we see like if, there's, if there's value in the community. Like if we, like for example, if we've got a, a way of doing CPU pinning that is very specific to our use case and this, this is, I mean, this is exactly what one of the things we keep downstream. It's very specific to our use case, so we this kind of thing doesn't really make a lot of sense for us to push to, to the community. Now, maybe someday, like when Kubernetes has expanded the way it so it does CPU pinning, maybe there'll be like a way we can plug it in, but it's just not that way today. So those examples are where, cases where it just doesn't make sense. But there are a lot of cases where it does make sense for us to 
push our use cases and have them support in the community. Um, there's there's tons of these that we have we've worked on. Um, I mean, I can name a whole bunch of them. Like he was talking about the with with scale, we our, our scale's pretty large, larger than I think most people out there. So we've done a lot of work to actually find, you know, take our work and bring it upstream, our experience and and try and find bugs uh, within the community. Like we found numerous um, bugs and we bring them upstream, we talk about them and we develop them in the context of our scale and then we fix them in the community. And there's a number of these, like I, I think another good one we did was like VM pools uh, where, you know, this was a new API that was created out of thin air where we, based on how we do our scheduling of, of our of our work for workloads, we want to have pools of of uh, of different VMs, and kind of the way you think about this is like you know like warming, right? Like if you think even in the VDI use case, like you want to have warm sessions available to allocate at a time. And so the idea was that okay, well there could be an entire API that could be done in Qvert to actually handle this exact use case. And so that was actually one of the, some of the work we did to create this new API for called VM pools. And there's numerous others, and I'm probably not remembering half of them, but but so the, the answer to your question is whenever it makes sense, like it's something that belongs in the community that we want to have, you know, support in the community that others could use, we we try to push it there. And in the case that it doesn't, um, we hold on to it and continue to maintain it until maybe the time comes that we can, or, or maybe it doesn't. We've got a few minutes. Oh. <laughs> Since the demo was recorded, I didn't get the... I think there's a question if there's maybe a discount on GeForce Now in order to allow the audience to... Uh, oh, yeah. Works. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, the <laughs> it's, there is a free tier if you want to try <laughs> it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you want to try it, there's like, um, I think you can, there's like, you can play for two hours or one hour. Okay, see so someone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, but yeah, uh, and you can try it, and you can run on Qvert. Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. So while there are active workloads for people st streaming a session gaming, are we doing live migration of their? active game, their session? The answer is no. And uh, there are various reasons behind it. Um, so if I've been talked about bridge networking, one of the things, uh, there's there's sort of a gap here in, in actually being able to do live migration without any interruption. Well, okay, there's a few, there's more gaps than just bridge networking. But one of them is specifically with bridge networking, we have, it's, it's, we don't have the ability to support migra live migration with bridge. There's also problems with, if you can imagine, with physical devices and how you actually live migrate with a physical, if you're passing through a physical device. So yeah, the, we don't today, um, but there may be in the future with some vGPUs and maybe it's a little bit more, more work on, on, on being able to do bridge networking, we might be able to do in the future, but so not today. Thank you very much for the questions. We sadly only have a few seconds left before we're getting kicked out. Uh, but in case you're more curious, feel free to, to stop by and catch us somewhere. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. <laughs>